Hi everyone, it's Meng. I'm from Design Plus Code, and uh, it's been a while that we haven't done any live stream. So I'm really excited, and at the same time, it's I'm not sure if I'm gonna be doing well today. But it's nice to see a little cr a little crowd, and uh, we're going to discuss about some of the new uh, trends, if you will, and how to use them with a sense of, um, you know, how, how to mix the styles and how to do it with moderation rather than just going uh, full in with either new morphism or glass morphism or clay morphism. A lot of these isms are really of the same cloth as before, which was skeuomorphic, and that was when we were really hard on trying to create real life replication of design. So for example, a desktop looks like a desktop or, you know, you know, you have like stitch leather or calendars and disc had a real like feel to it. But I think as we move forward, what's happening is that we're trying to simplify uh, all of that. We're trying to make it more towards sort of flat design, but flat design is kind of like the complete opposite. And with a new trend, we're trying to take some of that detail that we used to have, and we're trying to moderate it. We're trying to make it simple and, uh, you know, and clean, but also moving towards an evolution of design where you know, it feels more lively and it's, it's not a one, 180 degrees versus, you know, skeuomorphic. So that's why we are seeing a lot of these new trends coming in, such as glass morphic design, such as uh, clay morphic design. Um, but the question is, how do you use it in the way that still fit with the current trend, which is still very flat? And, uh, you know, oftentimes you're going to see uh, a lot of gradients that's been used. A lot of people making jokes about Web3 and, you know, a lot of these gradients that are kind of inspired uh, a lot with Apple wallpapers or websites like Stripe. And, you know, and I think it's important to kind of like take some time to digest all of this and, uh, you know, to play with the styles and see how they mix together. So, yeah, you can see a lot of gradients being used, a lot of uh, waves and blobs, a lot of lines. And I think that's really fun. Uh, a lot of illustrations as well. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of 2Ds and 3Ds. So we're at an exciting time in design because we are trying all kinds of things and uh, we're trying to see what fits and we're trying to stand out because there's so many templates nowadays, so many people trying to replicate uh, different styles. And so how do you make your, your design stand out is the question. So let's take a look at some of these trends, um, starting with uh, new morphic design, right? So new morphism. And uh, I think this is definitely difficult for a lot of beginners. And I say this because this comes from uh, a lot from skeuomorphic design where we, we used to have a tool like Photoshop and we used to have so much more control over the textures, the lighting, the 3D effects. And so if you want to learn this from scratch, it takes a little bit of time. Uh, for those who are less experienced, they will more focus on just having a single button and having the outer shadow from the top left uh, and, and bottom right, and then the inner shadows. And so it creates this, but then does it fit with the rest of the design? And that's kind of like the question. And you see a lot of these sort of like not there yet type of UI where it's just more like an experiment and it doesn't feel like, uh, it, it feels like it could be so much better than that. It should be a lot cleaner. Um, and then you have like a more moderate style like this one. So. This is simply using a gradient. It's not using the outer shadows. Sometimes it's using the drop shadows. 
So there's a lot of variation and that's what you need to understand. It's not black and white and um, we have to, you know, we have to understand the techniques. We have to apply that to existing designs. And if you're working with a team and typically you're going to have existing designs and you want to uh, create like a design system with new buttons, with new styles and gradients. And so, you know, it's not, it's really not black and white. So this is really interesting. There are some good examples. I think this is pretty good. Um, and there are some less good examples that are kind of too experimental in my opinion. Um, like this one, I think, for example, the, the light is too strong, you know, and, um, it distracts too much from the content. And at the end of the day, even if you're trying new styles, it's important to understand that you are focusing on the content, right? This is all about visual hierarchy. This is all about focusing on the right buttons and the right content and bringing a degree of aesthetics that is pleasing and uh, and not distracting. So yeah, new morphic is really interesting. I think people are starting to mature a little bit, but I think it's a little bit too heavy to be honest. From also, especially from a, an execution standpoint, where we have too many shadows, um, and uh, it it doesn't fit. It takes too much space. Like the buttons takes too much space. It fits for some UI, such as you know a knob, like a giant button but it does not fit for smaller buttons. And so I think a natural evolution to that is really clear UI. And why is because, you know, we're, we're moving towards more and more like um, 3D illustrations. And so the design has to fit with those 3D illustrations. To give you some example, you know, we have like beautiful, beautiful, illustrations in the Figma community where, let me see, um, you know, 3D illustrations. So you, you have a lot of these 3D illustrations uh, that are, you know, kind of like using 3D software and 3D is a lot more approachable nowadays. A lot of designers are learning uh, Cinema 4D. So, you know, it, it really fits. And then we have these really inspiring websites such as Pitch that really use a lot of 3D illustrations um, and, and they, it, it's just really, really nice. It adds this kind of like clay feel to it. So it's not like a fully realistic style. It's more like a clay uh, style and it's really nice. So the question is how do you mix these 3D illustrations with your 2D UI? And I think that's where the direction of clay morphism is going towards where, you know, we're going to have some buttons and uh, at the beginning you'll, you'll probably see something like, okay, how, how do you create maybe just the buttons, you know, to have a little bit of bevels like this, you know, a little bit of um, gradients and a little bit of inner shadows and the drop shadows is something that we've been using for a long long time it's just that drop shadows have become so much more spread out and so much uh, subtle so much more subtle if you look at the history of drop shadows back in the days you're gonna have a button like this one um, that's probably like um, either square or with, with minimal rounded corners. When I say back in the days, I mean like year 2000, 2010. And then you're gonna have, uh, I don't know, something like white and the drop shadows were super cheesy. So you're gonna have something that looked like this by default. And I remember if you use Photoshop, the drop shadow on Photoshop by default is 75% is opacity, right? It looks like this and it's super cheesy. Um, and so, if you are starting out in design, typically um, you, you're gonna see a lot of these like very strong sh uh, drop shadows and it's, it's really easy to fix really. Um, all you need to do is to, to move from a, a distracting drop shadows to something that is more subtle. And 
all you need to do is just to lower the opacity of the drop shadow to about 25% or even 15%. So that is, that is the first step. Um, and this is like Web 2.0 drop shadows, right? It's, it's not mind blowing, it's very minimal. Sometimes you would have, you know, a, a one, three, so three and then one. So super clean. And uh, if you look at a UI like, um, I don't know, Bootstrap is very much like that. And this is the era of Web 2 um, a lot. Now, Web 3, or at least kind of like if you see a lot of the new drop shadows, you're going to see these drop shadows spread out a lot. So for example, you're going to have something like 20 and 10, right? And, uh, you know, if you look at Apple TV, for example, you're going to see a lot of these uh, super spread out uh, drop shadows when it's selected or active. And uh, it's going to still use the gray. But then as we move forward more, uh, you know, Apple and all of these, uh, a lot of designers are starting to use more colored drop shadows. So something that represents, you know, more towards the background. So for example, if you have a blue background, so let's say I have like, um, um, like a colored background, okay? Like a dark blue background or a purple background like this one, and I would have my button on top of it. So instead of having just a, a black drop shadow, you would have a color drop shadow. I think it's gonna be more uh, obvious if I make it lighter, because when you make it lighter, the drop shadow that is gray uh, combines less well with the, the, the colored background. So maybe a, a more a better example. So you can see that the blending of the gray with the, the mid blue does not fit as well. Instead, what you can do is to use a level of vibrancy and Apple has introduced that since iOS 7 with vibrancy. And so vibrancy is simply to use, you know, the drop shadow itself. So there's two ways to go about it. So you can set a higher drop shadow and if you leave it like that, it's super cheesy, but you can also use, for example, overlay. So now we have a drop shadow that is slightly colored and it blends much better with the background. And so, um, so that's one way to do it. And I think that's probably the most flexible way. The second way to, to, to go about it is to use, um, you know, a color directly. So for example, you're gonna use the eyedropper and you're gonna eye drop the color itself and then you're gonna move to a darker tone. So you would manually uh, select the darker tone of the drop shadow that fits. And this requires a little bit more experience because then you have to kind of understand um, complementaries and uh, colors and stuff like that uh, and monotone colors. And you need to sort of play and it goes a lot with your gut to see what works and what doesn't work. So. What I recommend is simply use um, maybe uh, an overlay with black. So that's, you know, that's quite easy to do. And so you can see that I can just use overlay. Oh yeah, I still had overlay, so I shouldn't have done that. Um, maybe I should just, uh, let me just go back here. Okay, so you can see that the drop shadow is a lot, lot more you know, vibrant as, than this drop shadow without, without being super distracting. I think that's the goal, not to be too distracting. And if you want to make it less dis distracting, you can set it to 50% uh, or 25%. Because we're using overlay, you need to make it uh, with high opacity, otherwise it's not going to be visible at all. So 50% is fine. And then, uh, you know, so otherwise, like I said, you can definitely use a drop shadow that is normal um, but then you have to use the uh, eyedropper and then you can sort of like manually pick um, the right color. And typically the eyedropper is going to use the correct, you know, hue, which is really important because the drop shadow has to fit um, with the environment. So the environment being the background. So you want to make sure that we're selecting the same hue. And so 
it's gonna fit a little bit better. So now I can set a little bit more saturated, right? Now, if you look at these three examples, this, you can see that the gray fits less with the background. This one, you can see that it's a lot more vibrant. And this one is a little bit more in the middle where, you know, the, the drop shadow um, blends much better and it's a lot more subtle, it's a lot more neutral. And I think uh, you have to decide your level of comfort uh, in terms of like how you play with that. Now, why do I spend like five, 10 minutes just discussing about drop shadows? Well, the reason why is because it, it's so important. It's so important with all of these styles, regardless if you're using uh, clay morphic, glass morphic, or, or normal or flat. So you have to understand drop shadows. Now, there's a fourth one. And this is the, a lot de derived from the third example. The fourth one is when you have a, a colored button. So for example, you know, you have a white background, which happens a lot. And you have a button that stands out. And, and that's great because you want buttons to stand out. Now the question is, should you use a drop shadow that is simply black like before and it's super cheesy should you use 25 percent and that's you know like i said more like web 2 so it's you can see that the drop shadow does not fit well with the button itself the color of the button right and you know so you can use the same hue okay so for example you can say Okay, I want to use this drop shadow. I want, I want, I don't want it to just be gray or just use black with opacity. And so, what you're gonna use is the color of the back of the the button itself. And with that, you can use with um, opacity. And now you have a more vibrant glow, if you will. And this is, you know, if you look at real life, and you have like let's say an AirPod that is you know, very much colored, and you put that on a white table, you're gonna see that the color of the AirPod is spreading on the table itself. And that's kind of like what I, you know, I like to call this like contextual drop shadow. And um, it makes it really nice, and it makes it a lot more vibrant than this. Um, and you don't need to use, you know, exactly the same saturation. When I say saturation is how vibrant, the color is so for example you can decide to have a, a drop shadow that is using the same hue but you can move the saturation to be much lower and so you're still retaining that um, that contextual color but it's not going to be as vibrant and you can definitely also play with um, um, with you know the blending mode or you can play with uh, the level of brightness and saturation and also the level of opacity, right? So if you compare this to this, you can see that even though it's about the same level of subtlety, the drop shadow here makes a lot more sense than the drop shadow here because it takes the context of the button itself. And, uh, and, you know, so, you know, that's just something to keep in mind and to play with. Um, and, you know, as usual, I'm not giving you like a full answer. I, I'm not saying that one is necessarily better than the other one. I'm just saying that if that is your goal, right, if that is what fits with your design, then you should definitely um, move towards that goal. And I'm just showing you the techniques and the reasoning behind those decisions and, and why we're using it this way. So now let's talk about uh, like a clay morphic button, right? Because, you know, let's say you have a new screen. Okay, so I'm going to create a new screen, let's say an iPhone mini. And so if you want to have a white button, definitely have a background that is off-white. So we can either use gray or light blue, like this one. And, you know, I think because all the new phones are using, 
you know, this big round of corners, it made sense to use also, like, let's say a 50 round of corner for your artboard so that it represents sort of like how it looks like from a phone perspective so that you're not going to end up creating a button here that's going to be in the way of the notch or the home indicator or the round corners of the device. So, and I, it, it also looks a lot nicer, right? Like, you know, you see a lot of these new designs, that's how they present it. And design is a lot about presentation, to be honest. Um, I think, you know, if, especially if you're starting out, you need to understand presentation because presentation is what's gonna get you a job, right? You wanna, you, you wanna be able to, um, to get people's attention. Um, you wanna post it on social media, you wanna create a portfolio, you want to have uh, a lot of people following your design. So your presentation is gonna help you a lot. It's like the difference between, you know, uh, having a resume written in Comic Sans. Oh, we have a spam here, a spam, okay. Sorry, I'm keeping in, ch I'm checking the, the comments so that we don't have spam. Okay, so, all right. Um, back to my thoughts. All right. Um, yes, presentation is really important because like it's, there's a difference between having like a resume written in Comic Sans or a resume written in, let's say, Helvetica. And you need to make sure that you have like proper layout. You know, it shows that you're, you care about the details, the design and stuff like that. And so, you know, it's, it's good to have a, a good presentation. It's good to have like, let's say, you know, you want to have a degree of hierarchy. For example, you can definitely add like drop shadows and uh, to your artboards. And so, you know, for example, you can set a drop shadow. I like to be able to use, let's say um, 60. A lot of these numbers, by the way, are, are, are based on the size. So the bigger the element is, the more, the bigger the drop shadows. And the same with the text, the bigger the element, the bigger the text. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and then, you know, back to, to our techniques about drop shadows, we can set using eyedropper, and then we can set a darker tone for that. And so I'm, right now I'm setting it manually because, because I'm quite comfortable with it, but otherwise you can always set it just to black and use, let's say, um, overlay, right? And sometimes you can also, if you don't want the same level of vibrancy, you can use soft light as well. So now I have about the same thing with, with less effort in terms of like, what color do I have to pick? And so I have my artboard here. And so I can create a frame for an illustration. Um, a lot of people ask about, you know, spacing. And um, what I can say is that, yes, you can use grids but I'm very comfortable with the spacing. And this requires a little bit more experience is to understand what are the paddings, okay? This is a lot more compatible also with the way, you know, we code designs. And uh, we don't really use grids in, the, in SwiftUI or in UIKit. We m we're mostly using spacing from the borders, spacing between elements and stuff like that. So for example, a normal spacing for content, and this depends on the level of uh, information density. So when I say information density, this UI here has more information than this UI here, right? And when you have less density, you can get away with a bigger padding. So for example, I can set it to 30. And uh, right now it's at 18, so I'm just gonna move it. So let's say X30, Y30. And then you need to make sure that you are setting a consistent space all the time. So I'm gonna set it to 30 from each side, okay? And let's say this is my frame for my title or my cover and then we have to deal with the rounded corners as well. So one of the reasons why a lot of new designs are using really big rounded corners is because of the device itself. 
devices now nowadays have these big round corners and so it feels a little bit weird or at least you know one way to approach it is to make sure that the round corners fit the round corners of the device so for example i'm going to set it to 30 and now you can see that it's following perfectly as if i have a line like an invisible line that goes from here to here and so if I was to be more, so you can see it's really weird if I do it like this. So if I do it like this and the ob object is closer to, to the border, then I have to make sure that my rounded corners is following that invisible line like this, right? And so we're trying to welcome um, those things, those um, context. That's one of the key principles of design is to respect uh, the context of design. So, so let's say I want to have an eight padding. And you know, one thing I can recommend is just go with increments of four and uh, to start with eight at, at a minimum uh, because four is too little from, from a padding and spa spacing perspective unless you're talking about spacing between elements. But spacing between borders should always be uh, at the very least eight and most often is going to be 16. So 16 is the most used and Apple use 16 a lot because of the information density that most of the apps use. So for example, if you look at Twitter, you know, they're probably gonna use 16. Um, so 16 is definitely the most used and then you have 20 and then you have 30. So and sometimes in between you have 24. Again, dividable by four, and the round corners is trying to fit as much as possible with the round corners of the device. All right, so let's say I have 16, and let's say this is my, um, this is my background, and my background, I wanna use the same hue as the current background. I'm just gonna play a little bit with the saturation and brightness. And then I will have to use an illustration. So we're really lucky because there are a lot of like really cool packs of 3D illustrations, such as Sally that we've been showing a lot. Um, you know, 3D education illustration here and Niku, which is uh, really, really cool. So this is the one I'm gonna be using today and uh, you can download it and duplicate it. You can go to components and then uh, we can use one of these illustrations here. So for example, let's say I really like this inbox one. I can go back to my uh, design. So, and I'm going to paste it. It's really big at the moment. So I'm gonna use the aspect ratio. And let's say I'm gonna set it to 500 and set the zero in Y position to, to zero. And then from here, it's a lot easier to resize. So it's gonna look a little bit like this. I'm not gonna spend too much time on the detail, but uh, one thing you can do quickly is to align to the center center. And that, you know, makes it so much easier. Uh, you can also set like more spacing, as I mentioned before, to have a good amount of negative spacing. And then um, from here, you can add a title. So let's say uh, learn, design, and code. And you can set it across two lines. And depending on like how much the text is overlaying with the, with the content, you can definitely move that text and move the content a little bit as well. So, so that they don't uh, depending on the contrast, right? Like one, one of the key rules is to make sure that your text is always uh, readable. Um, and so you can definitely play around with the, the alignment. Just make sure that to be, to be consistent across all your screens. If you have this here, um, you know, at certain position, then your other screens that are using the same cover is going to have exactly the same position as well. And so, uh, you know, you have a title, it's really important to have also a text. So I like to be able to just, one thing to, that I, I love to do is to be able to select the element 
and to just option drag, but also using shift. So because I, because I do this, these two elements will always be aligned with the second element. And so that's, that's a really neat trick that I use because alignment is so important. Okay, so um, a title, if you learn a little, you know, if you're taking a lot of the previous videos that, I've, uh, that we've been sharing recently and over the past live stream, um, you should start to get familiar with the size of the text, the title, like the body text and the captions. So those are the, th the three main sizes for the text. So the title has a maximum of 34 typically. The body text is typically 17 and also it's regular. The title is typically bold. And so the rest is just getting uh, the proper uh, example of a text. So let me just copy this. Okay. Now today I'm using a custom font and you know, I wouldn't recommend to do this if you have a little bit, you know, like if you want to implement this in, if you're working with a team, but let's say you're a designer, you want to stand out. It's, you know, it, it makes sense to use a custom font and you're kind of like um, here and you have maybe a little bit more experience. So the font represents like at least 50% of your design. So to select it correctly is really important. Um, you should definitely start with uh, the Google fonts, which are free and they're automatically available in, um, in, uh, you know, Figma. And, uh, the second thing is font pairing. So font pairing is using a good font for the title and a good font for the body text, because let's say I'm using, you know, Montserrat or walks on. So Montserrat, for example, is a really good font. But if I use Montserrat for the text as well, it seems to be a little bit overkill. It means that it's taking too much space. It feels like this text is, um, is meant to be more for a title, uh, at least from, from this perspective. So one thing you can do is, is to pick a font that is more suitable for the text. And you can definitely look at some of these, um, you know, you can Google like font pairing and you can look at some of these um, recommendations from the experts and from also examples that are, uh, you know, that are live. So they're going to give you examples of the title versus the text. And this is how it looks like. And that's going to be really helpful. And so you can play around with these good options. So how well it looks when it's bold and big and how well it looks when it's a body text, so small and regular. And so, you know, uh, definitely play around. If you're more in a traditional kind of like UI, such as newspaper or something that is like print related, then you might want to use a serif font. But typically I would recommend a sans font. A sans font is without all of those, um, you know, curves and, um, um, I don't really know how to, how to use the proper terms, but you know something like this that looks more professional, uh, traditional, and something like this that is more um, neutral, if you will. So here, what I'm using is Work Sun for the title, and then I'm using Open Sun for the text for the body text, and I think it's a pretty decent combination. So. I would have something like this, and then we can get into the buttons now. So clay morphism, uh, the question is how do we fit with the 3D illustrations, which a lot of people are starting to use a lot. And um, how do you play with the drop shadows? So you also need to be familiar with you know, the size of the buttons. So for example, you would have something like 250, and then you would have around a corner that, you know, I guess fits with your other around the corners. So let's say if you have this container that has a pretty big round the corner, then you want to make sure that your button is going to fit with that round the corner, um, depending on the, on, on, on the positioning of the button. So for example, if it's positioned here, then you can have um, like a smaller round the corner, but if it's positioned here, maybe a slightly bigger round the corner. 
So again, the context is super important in design. So let's say I'm gonna use something like uh, 20 or 18. And another thing that you can use is what we call smooth corners. So you're gonna click on the option for the round corners, and then you can set uh, sort of like, if you wanna have a button that has like, let's say more like a leaf style, or if not, you can also use the round corners for iOS, so the smooth corning, uh, corners. And um, this 60% is iOS, but you can also go even further and um, it's gonna look very blobby and this fits very well if you have like, let's say blobs in your design or if you have waves and stuff like that, it's very playful. So let's go with that. And then we're gonna start with our simple claymorphic uh, button. So, so we have a white on top of off-white background, and then we're gonna use an effect. We're gonna use, we're gonna start with the inner shadow. The inner shadow is going to, we're gonna start definitely with the bottom right. Okay, so something like this, like minus eight, minus eight, and then a blur of about eight, or a little bit more, depending on like where your position is. But typically, the position should be a little bit less than the blur itself. And let's say I have eight, four, four, eight. And then, as I explained before, super important to use the eyedropper tool because my I can't use overlay because the button is white. And because the button is white, overlay is not gonna work. So I'm gonna use my, my technique for the eyedropper and I'm gonna reduce the brightness and the saturation. And it's super important to be subtle. Be subtle. Okay, design is all about subtleties. It's all about visual hierarchy. If everything is distracting, then your design is gonna be confusing, right? There's no hierarchy. So drop shadows, inner shadows, um, colors, they all have to match together. And they all have to, you know, to have a degree of hierarchy. And especially drop shadows, you should always start with subtleties. And so here you can see that I'm using a color that is only very slightly, slightly um, darker than the tone of my background. Okay, now I cannot use the same tone as the background. And, um, you know, if I do that, for example, if I use this, you can see that it's, it's, you know, we don't want this blurriness. Design should always be sharp, okay? People respond well to sharpness. And so the drop shadow using the same color as the background is like it's fading too much with that background. So very important to have a degree of sharpness. So there's a fine balance between super cheesy and distracting and then too little. So the fine balance is somewhere here and it's very, very subtle. Once you have this, okay, once, once you found that perfect spot and it's gonna take practice, you know, don't get me wrong, this is not, this is not easy for a lot of people. It's gonna take practice. Once you have that color, you're gonna go to the hex color and you're gonna copy that hex value. You're gonna go back and you're gonna create another inner shadow. So inner shadow from the top left. So because I use four, four, maybe I can use two, two now. And maybe I can use uh, something like four for the blur. And, you know, maybe like, I guess it depends. Like you, you have to understand the lighting where it comes from. So in this case, it's coming from the top left. And so the white is kind of my lighting. And then the, the drop, sh the inner shadow for the, from the bottom right is my, uh, is, is my creation of that beveling, that 3D effect. Now, I wanna make sure that I'm using exactly the same color. So I'm gonna copy and paste the hex value. And then, right, super, uh, super subtle, but in this case, 
it's not sharp, right? You can see that it's too much like the background. So what I want to do is maybe uh, set a level of opacity. Okay, like this, maybe 75%. Or I can move the, sh the shadow like this. But I kind of like it at 2, 2. And, and there you go. So this has, you know, it's optional. All of these are optional, by, by the way. It, you can have where, very well without the top left sh drop shadow. And inner shadow, sorry. And that's what I like about Clay Morphic is because it's a lot less heavy than New Morphic. New Morphic, you're going to have so many uh, outer shadows and inner shadows, and they have to play really well, versus Clay Morphic is a lot more subtle, and you can get away with just a single inner shadow, a single a gradient or a single, like, you know, um, you know, the mix of the three, and you can play a lot with the lighting and stuff like that. So the last part is the drop shadow, really. So I'm going to set a very big drop shadow, so 20 and 10. Again, this depends on the size of your button. And again, we have to make sure that we're using uh, roughly the same hue. So I can use the eyedropper tool and I can make it, you know, I can play with that drop shadow. And so that's a new factor that, that's coming into place now. Because of the drop shadow, then my inner shadow is starting to look a little bit too blurry. So maybe I have to play around a little bit more with uh, that, you know, that inner shadow. So again, it's not easy. It's a lot of, you know, playing around and sometimes you can sort of like play with the saturation and the brightness. So here I'm going full saturation, uh, sorry, full brightness and a little bit of saturation to get that uh, sort of like sharpness. I want to be able to see the brightness, uh, the sharpness of my button. And, um, and uh, it depends on the drop shadow, the position of the drop shadow and, you know, I'm going to be sharing the source file, by the way, so you can be, uh, you're going to be able to play around with this. It's a cool exercise. There's no right and wrong answer. It's just uh, what fits with the context. And uh, I, I can, you know, I can spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes just on, on, on getting the right drop shadow. And that's what makes it so interesting, right? So um, to have fun with it um, and um, to get it to, to fit with your current design. So uh, once you have this, then you're going to be using a text in the middle. So let's say sign up. Since it's a button, the text is definitely going to be bold, right? So links, uh, so not links, but buttons, buttons that are textual or buttons that have a, you know, a, a frame like this one, it should be using uh, semi bold or bold. So and also, yes, you can use black, um, but oftentimes when you have like, like an off-white and you have a hue for the background, you should probably use the same hue as well. So for example, I'm using the eyedropper and I'm going towards the darker tone. And the same with this one, I can go uh, with a darker tone as well. So moving towards around this area here. And so I can, once I have this color, by the way, you should be consistent with your colors. Don't have different colors all the you know for every single element, right? So, um, very very important. Um, all right. So one last thing we can do is, I guess, you know, trying with a colored, um, you know, a colored button. So for example, oftentimes you're gonna have a button that is more neutral, and then you're gonna have another button that is more colored. And let's go a little bit crazier this time. We're going to use a gradient. So linear gradient. And I'm going to use a, a slightly angled gradient like this one. And, you know, make sure to have the opacity. And again, if you can master just the hue and the brightness and the saturation, always sticking the same hue, you have done a good job, 
at learning about colors, right? You don't need to know how to mix yellow and orange, and uh, those comes can come later. If you can just master monotone colors, you know, good job to you, right? And so, for example, here I'm gonna go like this and slightly lighter, and there you go. So let's add a little bit of, of inner shadow. Inner shadow, again, we can play with minus eight, minus eight. I would probably use the same uh, values as this one, just to be sure. Um, so four, 12 perhaps. But for the purpose of this demo, I'm kind of like doing it on the, on the fly. So sometimes I'm not gonna be always uh, consistent with the values, but I definitely recommend that if you have sort of like those values such as the inner shadows and uh, uh, and and all of that, you know, and, and the values for the X position, the Y position, the the blur and uh, the colors and the opacity. You should try to be as consistent as possible. And so, all right, so eight, eight, twelve, and you can use a black, of course. This time we're going to use overlay because overlay is going to work on my colored gradient. And overlay is great also in CSS and SwiftUI, so this is easy to replicate in code. So you don't need to worry as a designer, and I don't think you know a sensible developer is not going to complain about this for sure. But if you use like a custom color, yes, it's it's a little bit harder to you know to be consistent. But using overlay with black is fine. It's totally fine. And then I'm gonna have let's say a um, a second inner shadow. So you can definitely select the inner shadow in Figma and Command D to duplicate it. So now I have exactly, almost exactly the same values and I can make it come from the, uh, uh, the top left instead, right? So you can see it's, it's pretty cool. I have my, um, my sh inner shadow from the top left. I can also make the blur a little bit smaller this time. And, um, and also my gradient here mix with the the nice inner shadow with vibrancy which is using overlay i can make it slightly more you know slightly lighter like this and now we have a beautiful kind of 3d ish um button right and and then you can work with a drop shadow and the drop shadow is going to use the same color as the button because it's contextual and then we can set let's say 20 um, and 10 like this and of course we're going to make it a lot more subtle like 30 percent and now i have a beautiful and subtle button that is using kind of like um, a style that fits very well with the 3d illustrations that you're using right and um, and then i'm just going to copy the same text align this to the middle and set this to white, right? Make sure that the text is always well contrasted with the background. So if the background is dark, then the text should be white. And if the background is white, then the text should be black. And so you, there, are, there are multiple tools that's gonna allow you to set the, you know, to measure the, contract, the contrast ratio and uh, you know there are plugins such as Stark. It's a very good plugin that's going to allow you to measure the contrast ratio of the text versus the background. So, all right. So let me see. All right. So yeah, thirty spacing grouping elements super important and uh elements that are together should have less spacing than elements that are between sections right so for example this is a section so i'm going to group this together and this is a section this is a section these two together is a section so the way that i like to do it is let's say 
Um, I'm gonna have 20 between the elements within the same section, but I'm gonna have 30 between elements or even 40 between elements of different sections. So again, it comes down to the visual hierarchy um, to make sure that you have proper spacing and, and it's gonna allow you to have a good, a good scanning of, um, of that. So I'm not gonna reproduce this because that's not you know, the main topic today, but it's an onboarding. So I'm just gonna uh, move this here and then you, I'm gonna put the home indicator and so on, the, the, the small details. Now, let's finish off with one topic that I think is really important, is how do you take an existing design and apply it to a new style like cleomorphic design. So let's, let's try that. Um, I'm gonna go to a design that Syria made and that is really good. It's a claymorphic design. And so you can see that there's not a big difference between claymorphic design and, and um, skewmorphic. The only difference is that you can see that this button here is, has like a ton of drop shadows and inner shadows. And um, it's not going to fit well uh, across the entire UI. So, for example, if I move it here, you can see that it's breaking. And so that's why, you know, I prefer to be subtle, and I like where uh, claymorphic design is going. And um, and so a button like this is going to become more like a button like this, uh, or a button like the the one that we just created, you know, which takes some time. To, to get it right. And, um, and also I can take one of my design here and, uh, and try to, to make it fit. So which one that I did? Okay, so let's say this one. So uh, I'm gonna go here and let's say we have an existing design that is using uh, glass morphic. And by the way, you can definitely mix glass morphic design uh, with clay morphic, it's totally fine. But let's say I want to, let me see. I want to make sure that I'm getting the right one. So that was, oh no, that was not that design, sorry. It's this one. So let's say I'm going to use this one. And this is going to use um, glass morphic. I should probably space a little bit better but uh, I don't like the empty space here but you know I'm not gonna s I don't, I don't want to make you wait too long okay so now I have my glass morphic design the thing with glass morphic design is that it's not gonna work well uh, when it, the background is empty the whole point of glass morphic design is that it needs to have a background so for example it would work well if I have a background, it's a, it's a modal on top of, of this, it's an overlay or something like that. But if it's not an overlay, right? So for example, you could have like an Apple Maps style of overlay that move from the bottom like this, that's fine. But if it's not, then if there's no background, then you should definitely just, um, kind of like change this into a more, uh, a different style. It can be flat, of course, but today we're gonna explore a clay morphic. So I'm removing the effects of the background blur. And let's say I'm gonna use, you know, the same color as the button, right? And then you, now we just need to fit with um, a lot of the effects that we're using. So when using a glass morphic, you're gonna use a lot of like the blending modes because, because that's using vibrancy in SwiftUI. Um, but, you know, when you're using Claymorphic, you don't really need as much, except for maybe the inner shadows and drop shadows. Um, and also, we need to deal with the contrast. So let me just disconnect some of these colors. And I'm going to make them white because it's going to contrast better. And then... I'm gonna set my visual hierarchy. So oftentimes a lot of designers that are starting, they're gonna have pretty much the three texts that have the same exact color, which is white. And that's, that's not a problem, but if you wanna set visual hierarchy, 
you can definitely set it to um, to have like a lower opacity. So I'm going to set white, but instead of 100%, it's going to be, let's say, 60% or 70%. So now this is less important than my title, but it's still readable, right? I can still read it quite easily. And I can do the same with the second description. So let me remove that and set it white and set it to 60%. Um, and um, so you can see that this looks much better than this because it has a sense of hierarchy. And so that's a super easy fix that you can do in your designs. All right. So was it 60%? Yes, I think so. And sometimes if you feel like this is not readable enough, maybe you can even set it to 70% or 80%. As long as you have some level of hierarchy, it's going to be just fine. And also sometimes you can use a color as well to, um, um, to set that hierarchy. You, you don't have to use white or black with opacity. You can also decide to use some sort of an accent color. And uh, let me see. Yeah. So it can be something like this. So it's slightly purple. And it looks even better than before. Um, just you know some tricks and that that color can definitely more be more vibrant it doesn't have to be exactly um you know you can this requires a bit more experience but you can definitely use like a complementary color uh like pink that complements well and now you have a, a very nice uh injection of life into the design so there we go and then you know i guess it's pretty clean and um, if you want to play with you know the inner shadows and stuff like that but you can see that it's fairly easy to to just like um, sort of like adapt an existing design by just changing the colors changing the uh, you know the effects if you will and so yeah yeah so the status bar you should definitely use the status bar all the time. Um, it's just that I wanted to try with this frame, and, and I guess you can use a, a status bar, but it has to have a background. If the status bar doesn't have a background, it's going to look weird with this around the corner here. So we can always try let me s and see how we can solve that problem. Design is always about solving problems. So here I'm going to put my... Uh, my text and I'm gonna disconnect set it to black selection color is super useful in Figma because when you change the selection color is going to apply to every single color that each element is using in the group and so that's super useful now you can see that it's, it's a little bit weird when I set it like this um, because of the rounded corner here so one way to solve this is to have your status bar with a background so I'm gonna set a fill let's say that is this color or I, I can use a you know a background blur as well so just keep that in mind um but yeah definitely you know a good habit to use the status bar all the time all right oh yeah maybe i should i should show you how to use this since twitter just updated their profile and they're using <laughs> this hexagon it's super easy to do by the way all right so <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go to the shape. We're going to go to polygon and we're going to create like like this. And then uh, here's the magic. I, I'm just, just going to, so you can move the count, right? You can use the po polygon count and I'm going to set it to six. And then I'm going to go, go to rounded corners and uh, I'm going to set my rounded corners. I can even set the corners moving to make it cooler. And then that's it. That's the um, hexagon shape of the new Twitter NFT profile. And I'm just setting the color, right? So don't go too crazy with the colors for those who are starting design, um, especially developers. I said developers, once they start using colors, they get like, oh, wow, I love colors. And then they put colors everywhere. And then there's no more uh, visual hierarchy. So, you know, try to use uh, not too many colors. And, you know, if anything, if you're not sure, just go with the, 
the subtle ones so, such as this one and then obviously you, you would have to change the text for the contrast ratio and stuff like that but you know i you know i like to experiment which is why i like to use a lot of colors but that depends totally on your experience now we're just gonna use this guy because he's, he looks a little bit like me today um and there you go so we're moving that avatar um and we're gonna select the polygon we're gonna mask it together and when you use the mask it loses the background so you can do you can duplicate this mask and then you can remove the mask and uh and there we go so whoops all right i can make this a little bit smaller isn't it this fun right Cool. By the way, if you like the video, uh, give us a thumbs up and I'm going to try to do more videos like this. Um, but if not, that's totally fine. Uh, you know, we can just do a normal video. So this is my avatar. And as usual, uh, you should always have a, you know, like two levels of text to make things or even three levels of text to make your UI more interesting. So always starting with the title. Um, so let's say, right. And to summarize again, I like to duplicate and align, and then to be able to set the differences between title, body text and caption. So body text 17, regular center. Uh, I'm just going to set the text. It bears repeating because these are very basic things that um, it comes with time, but you know it's going to help you tremendously. And then we have the caption level. So caption level is about 14, 15. And again, we're going to center. Uh, so Montreal, Canada. And then you want to set some visual hierarchy so you can play with semi-bold. If your text is small, I would never go into light. Light is mostly for big, big titles. Otherwise, it's not readable. And, uh, and so we can also play with the opacity. So for example, this is going to be 50. And this is going to be 50 as well. And this is going to be 100. So now we have a visual hierarchy for the text. I also recommend to use to group them together and to use auto layout. And auto layout, you can center, and there we go. So going back over the sectioning of the spacing. So for example, this is one section, right? Um, so let's say this is 20, and between each text is 8. And then this is another, or 30, let's say 30, to be more. I, I don't like to have like... <laughs> I don't like to have empty space, by the way. Um, this is one of my goals is to never have like super crazy empty space like this. When you have a design like this, you have like a lot of empty space that can be used. So typically what you would do is to move this to fill that empty space. Um, but otherwise, you can also spread your padding perfectly in a consistent way. So 30, 30 between the sections. So one section, two section, th three section, uh, yeah, I have some problem with spacing here that I should be fixing uh, because the mass group is not set properly with the spacing. Well, anyways, I'm I'm gonna get, you know, it's not a big problem, but yeah, thirty thirty, and uh, in between the text because they're smaller elements, it's eight eight again, dividable by four even though 20, 30 is not really divided by four, right? But once you reach, um, you know, the increments of 10, I'd, yeah, it's, it's where you start breaking rules and it's totally fine. But yeah, I can, I can definitely go with 32. It's just that I like around, around numbers. All right, so let's go with 30, 32 just to be able to, to be consistent today. All right, there you go. Um, we have two screens here. Uh, again, I, I hate this empty space. So 
let's go with 50, 50, and about 60. So it's fine. Uh, you can also decide to center to fit better with the button. So for example, I can go with the center text and here is going to be center text and then center like this. So we have so many options. Go, you know, experiment. Don't be stuck with one pattern or the other. You know, go with what feels right. Develop your taste. Use a lot of apps and, um, you know, and have fun. And uh, I guess we have some time. I'm going to review some designs. So what, what I'm going to try to do with um, the members of Design Code. So by the way, if you want to join Design Code, uh, what we try to do, um, if this works, of course, is, is if you can join us and um, if you have either a subscription on designcode.io or a, you're a member on the YouTube channel, then uh, I can review your design at each of these live streams, hopefully every week if I can and if, especially if it's useful to our members. So send me your Figma design and I'm gonna be able to review it at the next live stream. And I'm happy to do that and help you grow and um, you know, tell you about your mistakes and what you're doing right. And so if that is helpful. Now, today I'm gonna review the designs from my team because one thing we, we tried to do recently was to, um, to get everyone to teach, right? Because teaching does not require you to be an expert. You just need to have enough direction and someone to kind of help you with the main mistakes. And also it's good to teach when you're a beginner because you are on the same um, level as someone you're talking to. And so it's a lot more approachable for them to be able to, to understand you because then you don't become too technical. And so that's one of the challenges of a lot of teachers is how do you have like 10, 20 years of experience and still have what we call a beginner's mind. Uh, but if you're already a beginner, you don't have that problem, right? And so that's why we're trying to get our team to teach. And in fact, it's been doing really well. We're, we're growing twice as fast as before versus having only me teaching about UI design and code. We have the whole team doing it. They're, you know, sometimes they're beginners just like you. Sometimes they have a little bit more experience, but most importantly, you know, I help them and, um, you know, I give them feedback and I make sure that everything, um, you know, makes sense for, and, and, you know, you're learning something that is useful to your career. So I'm going to be reviewing their, their designs and, you know, it's not because their design is bad, it's more like, how can we improve it, right? So this is one of the video that we, um, that Surasit is teaching. So a very simple UI where, you know, she's teaching you how to create this beautiful gradient, which I have no, um, no criticism on. And yeah, maybe one little issue here with the angular gradient center that you should make disappear with background blur layer. Um, but otherwise, yeah, this, this is pretty good. Um, you know, I would probably put these dots a little bit more here so that it's visible, but it's not a big deal. So spacing, like good spacing, what I would do is probably move this um, a little bit more towards the center and so that it doesn't feel like sections, right? So coming back to the idea of sections, you want this to feel like they're together, that this title and these illustrations are part of the same cloth. And so the eye, when you're scanning this design, is not wandering too much. And you want to you wanna wander in the pattern, so top left to bottom right, or left to right, or S shape, or, you know, there are many, many theories about these patterns, how the eye scan. I'm not going to go over all of them, but it's worth noting and it's worth studying, of course. So that's why I like to kind of like bring things together so that we don't wander our, sky, our, our eyes too much. And so, you know, you can see here, this feels a little bit empty and the spacing between the section can be better. So for example, these three can be part of one section and the spacing of, I don't know, 20. And then this can have like a subtitle so that would elevate the design a little bit and give more information. 
And so, and also the spacing at the bottom can be consistent to the spacing at the top. So if the top is 20 or 30, then the, the bottom should also be 20 or 30. So here, uh, we can definitely set the size to fit the size of the, of the title so that we can see more of the background. Because again, having this empty space can be, um, you know, can take away from the attention of, of the background, of the image. And so it can be really helpful to, 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 to work on that. So what else? Let me go to, oh, okay, so do you have the title here. I don't have the, yeah, I have the inspect here, but I don't have the, um, the values. But, uh, you know, a lot of people, they, they mix color and gray. If you're using black everywhere and gray, that's fine. It's very consistent. But sometimes people use like, um, you know, blue tone be because of the background. And then suddenly they use gray and the, the two tones don't fit together. So it's very important to, um, to, make, to, to not mix the hue too much. So let's go to another one. So this is a new one. And this is part of a new video that it should be coming today or tomorrow. Again, looks really good. Um, and it's really impressive because, you know, our design team has is started mostly with graphic design and, you know, doing uh, angle mockups and stuff like that. Um, and now they're really, really into UI design. And so I'm helping them. I'm, you know, giving them directions. And at the same time, they're teaching it. Uh, the basic techniques at the uh, at, at the moment because that's kind of the, the level at which they are right now. So this is great. And by the way, uh, Suacid is someone that started UI design like a month ago. So this is super impressive, uh, given you know how little experience that she has, and yet she's able to teach at this level. So this is really good. This is something that I would expect from someone who has maybe a year of experience, and. Um, um, you know, it, 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 it's your pace, right? Like you don't need, there, there's no real answer to how long it's going to take you to, to reach this level or to a high level, but there's always something to improve. Even for me, sometimes, uh, I get feedback and sometimes I make mistakes. Sometimes after a nice sleep, I come back to my design and I can see my mistakes right away. And, you know, it's not because I'm giving this feedback that it means that she's not a good designer or she's not fit for, for, for teaching. It just means that there's always something that we can improve. So, so um, yeah, you know, um, what I can say here is that, you know, let's see. Spacing to be consistent. So, for example, uh, you know, try to use a number that is divided by four. Um, but to be able to align is really good, which is why I recommend to have, you know, the frame and the auto layout because that's going to ensure that everything is going to be aligned perfectly. Yeah, group things together, really important. And, you know, this is fine because it's centering, but, you know, you can also, depending on the size of the text, you can also set the same size as the button or making the button smaller and, fit to here again not super big here definitely i would use maybe a sim a sense of hierarchy so for example this text is not the same color as this text uh, as i mentioned before this can be a little bit more like 80 percent op opaque or 70 percent then you have the icons here uh, i don't love these icons i think they can definitely be better so uh, and also she's mixing you know, 2D with 3D. So instead of doing that, to be consistent, I would use 3D icons here, or maybe an icon that fits better um, the illustration here and the style here. Um, so not a big deal. Um, good alignment. Yeah, so a lot of designers make this mistake, right? So this is 20, and this is 23. This is 21. Small details. Uh, this should be centered within this. And uh, again, 20 
or 24 or 30. And this should be a line, so this is 20, that's fine. And uh, yeah, we have a problem here for sure because uh, this should be aligned to the left and it feels like this alignment is, you know, is not consistent. Good spacing between the icon and the text is important. And yes, we have a bit of problem with spacing here from the right that we can solve. Really good card here. I like this card. It's, um, yeah, it's just, I think there's a bit of a problem with the, the spacing that should be a, a little bit more consistent. Yeah. But overall, if you look at design like this, like this shows to me that the person has already reached a certain level. I mean, I've seen people with one year of experience not being able to do a, a UI like this. So this is really impressive. Let's go to the next one. Um, this is from Suani, again from our team, and it's gonna be part of a new tutorial. So I already gave the feedback, she already fixed it to some extent, which is the spacing from the left. At the beginning, she had exactly the same mistakes, which is, um, you know, being consistent with the spacing, right? So 30, she fixed it. Um, so back to that idea of sectioning uh, the content. So for example, here we can have, so 20 and 20s, that's fine. So this is 20 as well. So, and the section here is, okay, so we have 18 here, but this is group and we have a bit of a problem with the size of the grouping. But it's pretty good, actually. Um, it's just that, I, you know, when you design, make sure that everything is easy to show the size. But I see here that she definitely has more experience because she's, she's using auto layout. And she's using um, the alignment with an auto layout. And so that makes it really adaptive as a design. From... An aesthetic standpoint, I'm not sure, or at least from this UI standpoint, I'm not sure what this is. Like, is this a UI or is this a modal? But it feels like a modal. And so this is competing a little bit with the tab bar. So that's how I, I would improve it. And to make it more clear that this is not a modal, right? That this is, you know, when, when I create a container, I typically don't want to make it um, not have padding like this. So I would create some padding if it's part of the content, but if it's part of the modal or a bottom slide, slide UI, like the maps app, then that's fine. Um, but then you wouldn't show the, the, the tab bar. So it's more like a hierarchy problem. And again, it's not a big issue. I think it's still uh, very good. Um, yeah, she fixed the icon. We do have some issue here with the alignment, but that's normal because it's fitting the size of the text. She's using auto layout, which is very smart. Um, yeah, again, we have a very impressive team. I mean, to be able to do this uh, with, you know, not a ton of experience is really good. So really good. I think I would play a little bit more with the colors and the sectioning of the content. So especially here, to be more consistent, to have like proper sizing of the containers. So right, right now you can see that I have a, a hard time measuring the containers. And uh, a lot of people may make this mistake, which is that they have a frame that is way bigger than the text and it's, it's hard to measure um, the spacing because of that. So you can see as a result, the spacing between the sections is a little bit all over the place. So when you come back to my design today, you can see that I have a much easier time to section, to section my content and to fix that spacing versus when I go here, I can't fix easily unless I change how the spacing is done for each element. And as a result, when I look at this design, 
I can see that it's not it it can be better in the in in the way that you know for example the subtitle should be closer to the to the title and um you know and this section between the two should have more spacing between this and this maybe these two are together and this is also part of another another um space and also i think this button is a little bit too big kind of um taking too much space in terms of the importance because when you say you know when you look at the screen like this the question that you have is like how important is each button like do you want people to play and pause more or do you want people to explore more right if you want people to explore more then yes it's fine to have a big button like this that steals the attention that is really really big but then yeah it's gonna be you're gonna have accidental taps between these giant buttons against this button and people are going to complain so that's kind of like what you can improve small details but and uh it's cool that you have like multiple iterations then you can explore and you can see like what works best um but yeah I hope this was useful and uh, I hope you enjoyed this live stream. Again, if you want to have your design reviewed, send it to me. Um, if you're a member of Design Code or on designcode.io, um, I'm happy to review your, your, your design on, you know, at every live stream and see how you progress and give you tips 